with longtime friend Liza Minnelli is a reinterpretation of the Gershwin songbook by country music performers and features Dolly Parton, Brad Paisley, Roseanne Cash, Lyle Lovett, and more. Frank and I are excited to welcome to the show an artist of many gifts, passions, and abilities, and a man who claims that Mandy Patankin based his character in The Princess Bride on his Uncle Jaime. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. (laughs) (laughs) The multi-talented Michael Feinstein. (laughs) Well, thank you, guys. I'm sorry, but I'm out of time. I have to go. He's got to go. He's got to go. <laughs> that wasn't the longest one we've ever done, believe it or not, Michael. Wow. Well, I'm very impressed. I'm, I feel like I'm doing archaeology into my own remains. Or something. You've, you've done a lot. There's a lot to cover in an, in an intro. Tell us about Uncle Jaime and Mandy Patinkin, because <laughs> we got to know. Uncle Jaime, Jaime Gates, was the oldest member of the Stagehands Union in New York. He first uh, worked in theater uh Lower East Side Yiddish Theater with Paul Muni and other actors. And he uh, worked the end of his career at the Morosco Theater, which was eventually torn down to make way for the Marriott Marquis Hotel. And so when he retired, they had to manufacture a 75-year pin because nobody had ever been in the union that long. Wow. And in the 70s, one of, I think Mandy's first Broadway show was called The Shadow Box. And I was in high school, traveled from Columbus, Ohio to see the thing. And uh, Mandy was quite amazing. And he became very close to Mandy. And Mandy wanted to do a a project or something with Uncle Jaime and made all these tapes recording Uncle Jaime's history. And Uncle Jaime talked like this. You know, I told you I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. And so Mandy told me, he literally, because I said, when I saw the movie, I said, that sounds like Uncle Jaime. And he... and. (laughs) And, and he said, yes, I, I based the voice, I am Don Jose. I am Uncle Jaime. It's Uncle Jaime. It was so, so, so Uncle Jaime lives in The Princess Bride. Indigo Montoya. Exactly. And I'm Indigo yeah. Montoya, yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, he's not. He's Uncle Jaime. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, ask him. That's it's, hilarious. It's true. It's true. So. If we get Mandy on this show, we're going to go right to Uncle Absolutely. Jaime. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and before we got on the air... Of course, one of those names that always pops up on this podcast, uh, Paul Lynn. And you said you've had some dealings with Paul Lynn. Oh, he was wonderful. <laughs> uh, actually, he wasn't. Actually, he was not wonderful. I, I loved him because it, oh, in, in Columbus, Ohio, we go every summer to see him at the Kenley Players, and he would do a play every year uh, like he did Plaza Suite. Mimsy, come out of there, Mimsy. You know, that all that. And... Uh, <laughs> I like his impression better than yours, Gil. It's, <laughs> it's really good. He's got a dead on. Oh, he was in. great. Yeah. Well, I grew up watching him. You know, like my favorite is uh, on the Hollywood Squares when they said, Paul, uh, a man reaches his sexual prime at the age of 18. At what age does a woman reach her sexual prime? And he said, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> great. But uh, but I'd watch him, uh, Ken- Kenley Players, and eventually uh, when I came to California, I'd, see, I'd be hired to play parties and and he was there and um, he was always drunk. And the more he drank, the more mean he became. And I was playing, you know, something like playing the piano, minding my own business. He came over and he said, pick up the tempo. <laughs> and, 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 and then he, he poured a drink in the piano. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, that's a no-no. Well, it wasn't my piano, but I felt bad for the host, you know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And and I, I heard, because I used to do Hollywood Squares, and one of the producers was uh, the original show, and he said that during lunch, Paul Lynn would get really drunk, and all the other people were getting along great and joking back and forth, telling stories, and Paul Lynn would get more and more mean-spirited and more and more anti-Semitic. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, he he uh, he became anti everything, I think. But uh, my 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 manager Jim uh, represented Paul, and he and his wife would go over for dinner, and they knew that at a certain time, 
uh, as Paul would drink, it was like, okay, we got to go. And everybody would leave because they knew they had to get out of Dodge before it turned ugly. Mm-hmm. 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 Wow. As long as we're telling stories about, uh, about misbehavior, uh, <laughs> in, in, in your wonderful book, and this, oh, this goes... Oh, you should play mi- Let's Misbehave. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm here all week. <laughs> I love it. We're going to talk about par- playing private parties and piano bars and all of that good stuff, Michael. But I was struck by the stories, and this goes back to Uncle Jaime, who worked with Jolson. Yes. And I was stuck, struck by the stories in the book of Jolson's pettiness. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Both be, both be, being envious of other performers doing well. Yeah, yeah. And there's that story about, is it Patsy Kelly or or Ruby Keeler that, that he was working with on stage? and pulled a prank it's a good story yes yes um uh yeah my uncle worked a lot with jolson and he would read jolson the yiddish papers because jolson couldn't read yiddish and so he would read him um the the yiddish reviews the yiddish this and that uh but jolson was 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 uh, was very very petty uh he would routinely come on stage and squat quash the applause for another entertainer uh so they couldn't get their due and uh, uh wow he he just uh, would he turn up the faucet right, backstage yes. to dr- drown out the he, sound he, of someone else's yes, applause? Yes, so he couldn't hear the applause. He would turn on the faucet so he couldn't hear it. Uh, <laughs> oh my god! Uh, Harry Warren told me a story that he was driving back from Palm Springs with Jolson, who was just who had just introduced two of his songs. Actually, Harry Warren and Al Dubin. So they're in the back seat. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Jolson's driver is driving, and Jolson's in the passenger seat. And the driver says, gee, Al, those songs you just sang, about a quarter to nine, and she's a Latin from Manhattan. Those are great songs. Who wrote them? And Jolson looked at him and said, who wrote them? With the composers in the back seat, he still couldn't give them credit for the songs. He, oh. he, he, he couldn't, he couldn't <laughs> stand it. Uh, oh. Oh. But, but uh, Patsy Kelly, I'm trying to remember what was it. I think oh, it's, it's the about story the, he had. A, he, he, she, he, they were in a show on Broadway, I think it was Wonder Bar, and she had to yeah, play she, a Pav, that's pa, right, Pavlova. That's the story. And uh, she had to do a death scene. A death scene, and uh, yeah. and he put bu- he put real buckshot right, in the gun. Right, that's what it was. He shot her with buckshot. <laughs> oh! And she said, "I did I did uh, moves the uh, that real dying swan that night." And she and she said he thought it was funny. You know, it, 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 he was he was an odd guy. What a great guy! <laughs> <laughs> so, but but he was wasn't was he the greatest performer that people say he was? Everybody, everybody I asked about said that. I mean, from George Burns to Sinatra to, I mean, you name it, they all said that. Sinatra actually had an interesting story about being on the bill once with Jolson. It was a benefit, and Sinatra was supposed to close the bill because uh, he had gotten, you know, he was at the, at the early height of his career, the first bloom of extraordinary success. And, and uh, he, he said, you know, Mr. Jolson, I feel that you should close the show. Uh, and Jolson says to Sinatra, no, no, kid, no, you're going to close it. No worries. Don't worry about it, kid. So Jolson was to go before Sinatra. So Jolson was supposed to do two songs or three songs. And instead, he went out and did 30 minutes. And he did one song after another, after another, all of his standards. And people were screaming and yelling, pandemonium. And then Jolson did another 10 minutes. He goes on for 40 minutes. And finally, he finishes and walks off stage. And he turns to Sinatra and says, follow that. <laughs> oh, jeez. Unbelievable. Oh, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and you and we, we jump around here, uh, Michael. Uh, cr- chronology and, and logical order are not our strong points. So I, I do want to ask about, since you brought Sinatra up, uh, playing that Chasen's party for his wife and, and meeting Frank, because that's a fun story. Yes, yes. I, I uh, had not met Frank, and um, I didn't know that I ever would, for that matter. I was still pretty much playing piano bars and uh, private parties and happy, happy to do so. And I got a call mm-hmm. from Chasen's restaurant, which your listeners probably know was the famous celebrity watering hall sure. in Beverly Hills. And I was hired to play a private party for Frank and Barbara Sinatra. It was Barbara's birthday party. And um, after I got the gig, I hung up and started thinking about the reality of what was to come, that I would be in the presence of Mr. Sinatra. And I decided I was going to try and learn every obscure or unusual song he had sung in hopes that maybe he would pay attention to the piano player. So I learned songs from like The Kissing Bandit, which is a movie he said he wished he'd never made. But I learned all Mm -hmm. these songs. And then 
the night arrived and I, I, I got to Chasen's very early and uh, they ushered me into the party room in the back and upright piano in the corner. And I just started noodling, playing, waiting for people to arrive. Then the guests start arriving. And it was, it was uh, Johnny Carson and, and Don Rickles and, and Gregory Peck and Dinah Shore. And uh, my hands were like atrophying. I was so scared. You, you know, I thought it was going to... You had to be a kid. I was in my 20s and I thought I was going to... Yeah. Early 20s. I thought I was going to hyperventilate. I was so, so nervous and excited. But I would play these songs. And, and uh, he and Barbara arrived, uh, nodded actually to me and sat down. And I, st- I was playing... I don't know, one obscure thing after another. And every time I'd play another, another one of these songs, he would look at me with the most perplexed expression. <laughs> and so I didn't, I knew I was having an effect on him, but I wasn't sure what it was, you know. <laughs> but after about an hour, he, he uh, got up from, from, the, from his table and came over to me and leaned over the back of the upright piano and looked at me with those piercing blue eyes. And th- this is what he said. Jesus, how do you know all those songs? How old are you, 12? <laughs> That's great. And, and uh, then he invited me to sit down and join him at the table, and he started telling stories, and then he and Barbara invited me over to their house for dinner, and that's how we became friends. So my plot, my wow. plan worked. Wow, well, great plan. So, and it had so to be an out-of-body out experience. What was Frank like to be friends with? Well, he was different with me than he was with other people in the sense that I spoke his language because I wanted to know about Mabel Mercer. Like I said, is it true that you went to hear Mabel Mercer? And I'd ask, talk about arrangers, songs. I didn't mm-hmm. ever care to know about Ava Gardner or any of that stuff, you know? So he, he knew that I was passionate about the music. So it gave me an opportunity to get to know that part of him, which was most interesting. Very smart on your part, well, part but also, also authentic. Yeah, it was just what, what, where my passion was. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he, he was he was a fascinating guy because uh, um, he was very volatile, and he re- he reacted viscerally to things, and uh, you never knew what was going to hit strike him this way or that. And mind you, I didn't know him all that well. I mean, compared to so many other people, but um, he was uh, very constant in the way he he uh, reacted. Uh, uh, at that, I remember one night at the house, they were talking about how Dean, Dean Martin, had quit. And Frank said, they're going to have to put me six feet under to get me to stop. Because that's what mattered most to him. It, it, yeah. At one point, Liza Minnelli told me she was flying with Frank when they were touring. And um, he was kind of sighing. And she said, what's wrong, Frank? He said, ah, I'm lonely. And she said, do you miss Barbara? And he said, I miss all my wives. Isn't that interesting? It is. Mm. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Let, let's talk about this fascinating journey of yours, uh, Michael. Because we... we lo- <laughs> Every, ev- everything prompts a song. This is a seasoned performer. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Well, we should tell our, tell our listeners before we turn the mics on, and we were trying to get the audio right, Michael was serenading us with one song after another, and it was a lot of fun. You, you grew up in Columbus, Ohio, which you describe as not particularly a hotbed of, of musical activity. Why did I ever leave Ohio? Yes, it's true. I grew up in Columbus, and uh, Columbus was the place where a lot of shows. Uh, my Uncle Jaime, who uh, who uh, mentioned earlier, Uncle Jaime said that yeah. Columbus was called the Death Town because shows never drew there, nobody ever did well there. And when Vladimir Horowitz played Columbus, it was the only city on his concert tour that didn't sell out. Uh, the symphony there was always about to go under. Uh, it was a, it was a sports town, you know, OSU and, and all that. And um, yet there was this great music exposure for me, thanks to my parents and, and, uh, and such. But uh, no, not, not yeah. a lot of culture in that way. It's different now, of course. I would imagine. But you, your story is one of people, it seems, you know, uh, uh, giving you opportunities and moving, moving you along in life. I mean, uh, not only your, pa- your parents, but your Uncle Henry gives you that wonderful collection of records. Uncle Jaime brought you to New York. You know, uh, what, what Ira Gershwin did for you is well known, what Liza and Rosemary Clooney did for you is well known. You, you've, been, you've been the, uh, the beneficiary of a lot of, uh, a, a lot of generous people. I spoke their language, so I had an in in that uh, they were usually intrigued that there was this 
teenager or 20 year old kid who understood their references. Yeah, I'd imagine. And so that's the, that was, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the thing that made it possible for me to have these friendships and relationships because I really understood their world, their worlds. At one point I was mm -hmm. working for Ira Gershwin, which was a six year period, most wonderful period of my life. And, and at one point, um, I, I said, made a comment about something that, that Ira had, uh, had written. And he was so intrigued and shocked that I knew about this. And then he looked at me and he said, how many others like you are there? <laughs> because he was so shocked that there was a kid who was 20 years old who, who, of course. who, who understood. So I, le I left June Levant out. Uh, 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 Oscar Levant's widow was also somebody who, who, who did you a solid. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's fascinating to, to, to reconstruct the story of your career. Maybe for you. <laughs> you. <laughs> well, t t tell us anyway that, and it's very interesting too, you think you never met Oscar Levant, but you've gone through your life thinking that you have a, a feeling as if you have a spiritual connection to him. That is true. I've always believed in reincarnation because when I was five, I sat down and started playing the piano fully, both hands, and I could play. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just my belief. But I always felt a connection with, with Levant and Right after I moved to California through a series of coincidences, I met June Levant. I went to a uh, used record store in Hollywood looking for a particular issue of Oscar Levant's that was his last recording, which at that point was rare, issued in 1961. Uh, they said, uh, the guy said, no, we don't have that, but we have this box of records that belong to him. And it turns out that they had this huge cache of air checks and soundtrack rehearsal recordings and stuff that was amazing. My eyes popped out of my head and the guy sold it to me for $200. I had to borrow $150 from my parents to pay for it. And um, then I was able to find a phone number for Oscar Levant's widow, June Levant, and called her, made a cold call to her. And she invited me over to the house because I knew so much about her husband and she was intrigued. And, and mm -hmm. Oscar was a hero to me, not only as a musician and considered to be the greatest Gershwin interpreter who kept the Gershwin music alive after George died, but also one of the greatest wits. I mean, he said that he knew Doris Day before she became a virgin. And uh, great, great he line. said Elizabeth Taylor ought to get a divorce and settle down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, there's a fine line between insanity and genius. I have erased that line. Also uh, great. And also when... Uh, Somebody was talking to Oscar about someone and said, oh, so-and-so is his own worst enemy. And Oscar said, not while I'm around. That's funny. <laughs> oh, That's funny. Some, something happened when we were talking off the air uh, that you are playing the way you look tonight. And if you could play that and if you could sing a little of it, too. Well, I could. But yeah, sure. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. Someday, when I'm awfully low, when the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you and the way you look tonight. Well, that song was from the movie Swing Time and uh, won an Academy Award for Jerome Kern. But I discovered that actually... The first eight bars of this song was a piece of underscore for a movie that Kern had worked on a year earlier at MGM called Reckless, which starred Jean Harlow, whose voice was dubbed because she couldn't sing. Uh, but uh, it was just a little piece of, of underscore that was written in, in, as a shottish because Kern loved these. Da, 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 da. So it, was, it goes, um, trying to remember exactly how, how it sounded. It was like... just eight bars and it repeated over and over again as this underscore and I was so shocked to hear that piece of music and, and to realize that that became the way you look tonight so he clearly loved that theme and turned it into a song with that gorgeous bridge with each word your tenderness grows tearing my fear apart and Dorothy Fields who wrote the lyrics said that that was her favorite lyric of all the hundreds and hundreds of songs that she Oh, that's a beautiful one. Is that one of your favorites, Gil? 
I, I, I'll I, tell you, that was, that was beautiful, the way you sang it just now. Really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Really beautiful. Yeah. Let, let me let me just ask you some stuff about about meeting Ira. And, you know, we'll, we don't have the time in, in, uh, in the time that we have here to tell the entire Feinstein story. But it is fascinating that you you can in those days you could look somebody up in the phone book and you find Oscar Levant's phone number and you're able to contact his widow. And this leads to a six year relationship with the legendary Ira Gershwin. Yes, yes. I had gone to a psychic who told me that I was going to meet Ira Gershwin. I'd never been to a psychic, but I was playing in a restaurant and one of the waiters said, oh, this lady's really great. She charged you $25 and told me that mm-hmm. I would meet and work for Ira Gershwin. I went, yes, sir. But it happened less than a year later. And uh, June Levant is the person who told Ira about me and, uh, and his wife, Leonore, and they asked to meet me. And so... Uh, uh, I went over to the house and I met Leonora and Ira and I was very, very nervous because Ira was somebody who was a true idol to me. And uh, the minute that Lee Gershwin opened the door and I walked in and saw him sitting in the distance, I started quaking because I was so overwhelmed that I was in the presence of this man who was 80 years old, who had written all these classic songs in the 20s and 30s and was still alive. And I had the opportunity to see and interact with him. I didn't know what would go from there. I had no idea that I would become part of their family. But Ira was autographing an album called Ira Gershwin Loves to Rhyme, which somebody had compiled of demos of him singing. And I said, gee, Mr. Gershwin, I have that, that album. He said, you do? You're the first person outside of a relative I've met who actually has this album. And, and we were sitting there, and he was very quiet and shy. And Leonor Gershwin and her sister, Emily, who was visiting from New York, were sitting in the corner watching this exchange. And to make conversation, I said, gee, Mr. Gershwin, I have a 78 of gems from La La Lucille. La La Lucille was the first Broadway show uh, with music by George Gershwin, 1919. And Ira said, oh, I bet it has the, the two most popular songs uh, from the show uh, on the record, uh, uh, T. Lumbumbo." And nobody but you. And I said, that's right. And Lee Gershwin turned to her sister and said, isn't that cute? He's telling Ira, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we, he, we clicked. <laughs> yeah, for, for, and for six years. Yes. He, he, was a fixture, he was a fixture in your life. And, you, and you, uh, she hired you to, to catalog his records and you wound up going through all the archives yes. in the house yes. and, and, and found wonderful artifacts. It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, just going through the records was amazing to find recordings of George Gershwin playing and all these things. And imagine. That, that in itself was, you know, as my tribe says, Dayenu. But uh, yeah, then the, 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 Lee, Lee came to me, uh, Lee Gershwin, about, oh, I guess about two weeks after I'd been working with Ira, just doing the phonograph records. And she said, you have given my husband a new lease on life. You have brought him back to life. And I'm going to open every door and closet in this house to you. Just, just stay busy and keep my husband happy. And that's what I did. And I found uh, George Gershwin's little black book with the phone numbers, names of all of his girlfriends that he carried in his wow. pocket, and uh, a little a tune notebook with themes that he had notated that were never realized into compositions, and letters in ephemera, his, his tie clip, and... Uh, uh, the, the fob for his watch that he used when he played concerts and um, things that Ira had sequestered privately in his closet, like the last document that George signed, which uh, uh, turned everything over to Ira when it was clear that George was so ill that they didn't know what was going to happen. And to mm-hmm. see the signature and the hand run off the page is one of the most poignant and heartbreaking things I've ever looked at knowing what happened to George dying at the age of 38 from a brain tumor oh, only, of only two days after signing that document. Wow. Wow. Did you find, and, and, and I have to say in the book, reading the story of the relationship between you and Ira, and you may have been told this before, it, it reads like a movie. Uh, it, it, it really does. I mean, this, the, the, the young, uh, impressionable fan comes into this, this situation with a, with a man who has, uh, in many ways, you describe him as, as, as depressed and so on, some, on some days able to, unable to get out of bed and come downstairs. Yes. And you, you did breathe new life into him. 
he, he, he got to see that somebody of another generation cared about this stuff deeply. It's true. It, 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 it changed. It really him. reads very beautifully in the book. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. It was, he did much more for me than I did for him. Uh, he, he was, he was so sweet and he never had children. I think he would have liked to have had children, but Lee didn't want mm-hmm. children. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, it was very close, very close relationship. He confided things in me that, that, um, I treasure uh, things that, that he felt open enough to share. And, and, uh, he, he had, um, never gotten over the, the passing of his brother in 1937. I was just, just going to ask you that, yeah. So it was, it, he was a very um, a, a sad guy. He, he, was, he, he, he held his feelings back most of the time. But one day I found a color picture of George, a color photograph of which there are very few in existence. And he just started sp- talking about George saying, look, look, look how youthful he is. Look how, look how young he looks. And, and, and I said, he has, I said, it looks like he needs a shave. He said, oh, he had to shave twice a day. He, he had such, so he just started talking stream of consciousness about George. And um, after that, it made him so depressed looking at that picture. He went to bed for two days. He didn't get out of bed for. Oh, he, I'm it, sorry. It just, uh, it just still affected him to that point because Ira wrote the lyrics. George wrote the music and, and um, Ira always said, why couldn't it have been me? Why couldn't it have been me? Because he felt that George had so much more to offer the world. Oh, he had survivor guilt. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah. What, what a fascinating character. And, and do, do this for us, if you could. One, one of the things that strikes me in the book is when you, you get deep with him into, into certain lyrics. And there's that lyric from um, Someone to Watch Over Me. Oh, yes. The handsome, yes. The handsome lyric. Yes, I know exactly. Can, yeah. can, and the, the, can you demonstrate for us? What that is to to anybody who writes songs or, or cares about this stuff, it's fascinating. It's it's so interesting because with Ira, I learned so much about uh, interpreting lyrics. Uh, it was it was life changing, of course. Uh, and he asked me to sing something, and I'd often sing his songs, and he would uh, coach me if I or correct me if I made a mistake. And one day, I was singing the bridge of "Someone to Watch Over Me," you know. There's a somebody I'm longing to see I hope that he turns out to be Someone who will watch over me I sang it with a little more feeling then But uh, the bridge is Although he may not be the man Some girls think of as handsome Well, I guess I've been listening to the Streisand recording Because I sang Although he may not be the man some girls think of as handsome. And he said, stop, stop. I said, what? He said, you ruined the rhyme. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's mansome and handsome. And I've never realized that. <laughs> Although he may not be the mansome, girls think of as handsome. It's that sort of thing. It's like Yip Harburg. Uh, people always sing, it seems like happiness is just a thing called Joe. What Yip Harburg wrote was, it seems like happiness is just a thing called Joe. Happiness is just a thing called Joe. Uh, it was written in vernacular uh, for Ethel Waters. So those sorts of things are easy to miss. And so I learned a lot about that. That is fascinating to me. And that all these years later, you know, he, he, it was still important to him. Oh, but, yeah. But you, you, you unearthed, uh, you unearthed uh, was it the girl I love that you, that you, that you found and showed to him and... Yes, yes. Can you, can you tell that story? How did how he reacted? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, The Girl I Love, uh, The Man I Love, was written in 1924 for a show called Lady Be Good, cut from the show because 1924 it was a frothy musical comedy starring Fred and Adele Astaire, Fred's sister. And uh, Adele sang it beautifully, but they realized it was slowing down the action. They cut it from the show. Then they put it in a show called Strike Up the Band in 1927, which closed out of town. And in that iteration of it, Morton Downey Sr., who was a, a, a very high voice tenor heartthrob of the time sang a lyric Ira wrote called The Girl I Love. Um, Someday she'll come along, the girl I love. Her smile will be a song, the girl I love, etc. And I found the lyric and I showed it to Ira. I said, this is amazing, a, a, a male lyric for this song. 
And he looked at it, and then he tore it up. I said, why did you do that? He said, he said because the song is so iconic as the man I love, I, I don't think it should be sung as the girl I love. And I said, oh, okay. And I had to respect it, of course. But then, oddly enough, uh, another two years later, somebody found the original full script for the version of Strike Up the Band that closed out of town. It later was mounted again in 29 and was successful. And it had the lyric for The Girl I Love in it. And I showed it to Ira again. I said, look, The Girl I Love. And for whatever reason, on that day, he was more kindly disposed to it being sung, and he gave me permission to sing it. So it survives. Wow. We will return to Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast after this. You know, there's nothing quite like the feeling of gathering around a warm fire on a cool evening. And a smokeless fire pit from Solo Stove makes your outdoor moments even more memorable. Because instead of having to constantly dodge campfire fumes, you could sit back, relax, and actually enjoy the fire. It's, uh, it's perfect for bringing family and friends together. And it's made with premium 304 stainless steel and a 360 degree airflow system that maximizes efficiently while minimizing smoke. Easy to light with a few bits of starter your fire is blazing in minutes. Perfectly portable. Take Solo Stove on your next camping trip. And that's Solo Stove. Shop now and get up to 30% off. 30% off fire pits all month long. And use promo code GILBERT. At checkout to get an extra $20 off, plus a lifetime warranty and free 30-day returns. Wow, wow, wow. Now, another song, because we're big Marx Brothers fans uh -oh. on this show. Oh, and he mentioned and Yip Harburg. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Could you Lydia? sing that? What? Uh, uh, the, the, the one from the Marx Brothers show or Yip Harburg? Lydia? Lydia or? the uh -oh. Tattooed oh, Lady. What a treat. La, la, la. La, la, la. La, la, la. La, la, la. <laughs> Lydia, oh, Lydia, say, have you met Lydia? Lydia the Tattooed Lady. She has eyes that men adore so And a torso even more so Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia Lydia, the queen of tattoo On the back is the Battle of Waterloo Beside it the wreck of the Hesperus too And proudly above waves the red, white, and blue You can learn a lot from Lydia La 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 la. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, there, there's a, oh, thank you. There, there's a, 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 a wartime lyric that Groucho sang on a radio broadcast that's not in, not in the, uh, the version of uh, At the Circus. It goes, let's see if I remember it. Lydia, oh, Lydia, that encyclopedia. Lydia, the tattooed lady. When she stands, the world gets littler. When she sits, she sits on Hitler. Lydia, oh, Lydia. So that, that they, uh, yep. Wrote wow. that, those lines for him that he sang later. Yeah. <laughs> Did you include that verse? That that verse in the uh, your your wonderful uh, children's album, Pure Imagination, which I have. Did you? Did you? Were you gutsy enough to include that? I, I, I think I did because children need to learn about those <laughs> right. things. Right. That was <laughs> so. Yeah. When when she stands. What are when the she stands, the world gets littler. When she sits, she sits on Hitler, Lydia. Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> That is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I, I credit you also, Michael, for putting that on a children's album. In, 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 in some ways, it's a rather risque number. Well, it's totally salacious, ha but what the hell? <laughs> Harold, Arlen and, uh, Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg. Yes. Uh, was, and, uh, and while we're on the Marx Brothers, uh, I guess we're talking right now to uh, Mr. Chico. Mark. Oh, he played oh, Chico. No. Michael, yeah, Michael played Chico. In, was that back in Columbus? That was in Columbus at Players Theater, Players Club. That's now Players Theater, yeah, yeah. 
How did you like playing uh, Chico in Minnie's Boys? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was it was great fun, and um, that show had a, a relatively short running time. So they added an epilogue at the end where I sat down and played stuff with the cast singing, and we did some vintage Marx Brothers songs. Which, as I'm thinking about it now, the the uh, the estate probably wouldn't have liked, but it, it was it was fun. Uh, it, it was also something that was probably the first time I I acted outside of high school. So it was, you, you are our second guest to have played Chico in that in that <laughs> show. Uh, uh, Peter Riegert, oh my the gosh. actor, played Chico. How wonderful! It, and I believe we, he was in the Broadway production. Was he in the original? Can we hear some of your? Can we hear some of your Chico? You know what? I uh, I I uh, I don't think I can anymore. Isn't that terrible? Because <laughs> uh, now all I do is Jewish accents and Peter Laurie and Paul Lind and Carol Channing. So oh, I, let's hear the Peter Laurie. <laughs> I don't know why you're asking me this. What is it that you want from me? <laughs> you bombed it. You bombed it. You've ruined it for all of us. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to make you guys this do doing Peter Lorre's. <laughs> Gilbert, Gilbert, give him some of yours as long as we're we're comparing Peter Lorre's. No, it's you who ruined it. You, it's your perfect attempt to buy it. Kevin the found out how valuable it was. No wonder he had such an easy time getting it. You bloated fathead! You idiot! I can die now. Oh, I've well, got dueling Peter Laurie. Well, that's that's superior to mine. Uh, but you know, Peter Laurie and and Liberace and Carol Channing are all very close. You know, I mean, because Peter, you do this, and if you want to do Liberace, you just go hello, everybody. It's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, very Thank good. Thank you very much. You want to hear some? Very some, good. Good. Some, oh, that's some, a good Liberace. Some boogie woogie. Thank you. I, I'm very, very, very glad to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and then Carol, you know, Carol is just, she's just taking me. Hello. I'm Carol Channing. Hello, Dolly. Hello. It's very nice to be with you, Lee. Thank you, Carol. I love touring with you. What are you doing? You're, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> so, you know, so. This is and, great. And Liberace back then was considered the ladies' man. Liberace back then was the ladies' man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Liberace was. Yeah, that that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, a confirmed bachelor. Exactly. That's what I, they. That's I what believe they used was the, the term they used to use. Speaking of Groucho, everybody came. Everybody came to the house uh, at, at Ira's house. I mean, Angie Dickinson would come through, and and the the legendary Swifty Lazar, who you didn't care for very much. No, okay. Doesn't sound like a nice person. No. Uh, oh, and- tell us a little about him. Well, Irving Lazar was was a guy who uh, had the most powerful clients in in Hollywood, and therefore he was the most powerful guy. And he was a, a very short, bald headed guy who had a germ phobia and uh, absolutely sized you up immediately. And if you weren't of use to him, you were you were invisible. And uh, he'd come to the house, and he uh, and I'd answer the door, and he would always walk past me and. Uh, um, not say anything and make a beeline for Ira to butter him up so he could make some deal for with the Gershwin catalog. And and one day uh, I answered the door and he walked past me and Lee Gershwin happened to be standing there and she said, Irving, Michael is very important in this household and you must treat him with the same respect with which you would treat us. And he was practically on his knees saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry, Lee. Of course, of course, of course. And because uh, Lee was was very quixotic and that in itself could have pushed him out of employment in, in, mm. with them, th- truly. So the next time he came over, I answered the door and he said, nice to see you. And then he walked in and walked past me. There was Lee. She said, Irving, did you say hello to Michael? And he said, yes, I, I just said nice to see you. Didn't I just say nice to see you? And I said, yeah, yes, yes, you did, Irving. Thank you. So <laughs> that was Irving. Did, uh, must, I must say it's shocking behavior for an agent. Did, uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the big, the, faint, the, the true story, Alan J. Lerner was convinced that Lazar was not reading any of his scripts. And he sent Irving a script, which he glued the pages together. And said, Irving, please read this and let me know what you think. And Irving sent it back with a note. It's the greatest thing I've ever read. And it was glued shut. He couldn't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Yeah. What was uh, was Groucho ever? Did, did you uh, did you meet Groucho? Did he come through? Uh, I uh, Iris House at any point? I missed Groucho the day that he came to the house. Oh, uh, he came with Marvin Hamlish, did. and uh, Groucho and Iris shared a love for Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm-hmm. And uh, Groucho loved his Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh right? yeah, oh yeah. And uh, um, Ira 
became giddy when Groucho would come over. He, he, he became giddy with Groucho, and he was giddy when he spoke to Irving Berlin on the phone. But he had known Groucho for years. But Ira was always so shy and retiring and quiet that, that uh, it was sometimes hard to read, uh, read him. But with Groucho, he, he, uh, even when he talked about it, he was gregarious. And uh, I found uh, uh, these, color, these stereo photographs. Uh, Ira had a stereo camera, uh, 3D, you know. And I found this beautiful image that he or Leonor had taken of Groucho playing pool at the house in the 50s. And I've often wondered... If I can get wow. my hands on that picture, because it's so resonant. Did you ever meet Bill Marks, Harpo's son? Oh, Michael? yeah. Bill is the most wonderful y- guy. Yeah, we had him here. What a great fellow. And I, I remember Groucho used to come on shows, and he would he would sing, On a tree by the river sat little Tom Tit, singing willow, tit willow, tit willow. And I asked him, oh, Dickie Bite, why do you sit singing willow, tit willow, tit willow? <laughs> Is it leak weakness of intellect, baby, I cried, or a rather tough one in your little inside? With a shake of his poor little head, he replied, oh, widow. Tit Willow, Tit Willow. Lovely. Thank you. Wow, a That's piece great. of Groucho I haven't heard you do on the show before, Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, uh, he also used to sing that Irving Berlin song uh, called Stay Down Where You Belong. That Berlin asked him Oh not my to God, sing. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, should I or you? No, no, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe he'll give you some accompaniment. Yeah, Gilbert. Down below, down below, sat the devil talking to his son who wanted to go up above, up above. He said, it's getting too hot for me down here and so... I want to go up high and have some fun. And the devil said, you stay down here where you belong. The folks who live above you, they don't know right (laughs) from wrong. To please their kings, they've all gone off to war. And not a one of them knows what they're fighting for. They're breaking the hearts of mothers, making butchers out of brothers. Uh, you, you can stay they, here. Oh. Where you, you but you, oh, right? So, yeah. Oh, you stay down, down here. Down here where you, you belong. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, well, uh, wow. Berlin used to beg him not to sing it. And that's why he sang it. <laughs> Seriously, Berlin would say Groucho. And the other song of his he sang was was Cohen owes me ninety seven dollars uh, by Berlin. And Berlin said you can't sing that because it's 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 uh, it's a very stereotypical. Jew. How does that one go? <laughs> Cohen owes me ninety seven dollars. Cohen's got to be the one. To... Basically, the song says that this old old man Rosenthal is sick in bed. He's about to die. But but then he Cohen owes him ninety seven dollars, so he's not going to die till he gets the ninety seven dollars from Cohen. So he's feeling better. But the, but now the it, it's it's uh, uh, it, it, only a Jew could get away with writing it. Yes. <laughs> Which brings us to another thing. Frank and I were talking. We talked about this a few times. What's that? How come there are so many Jewish songwriters? Well, especially the Ten Pan Alley g- crowd. Yes. I mean, they're they're all Jewish fellas from Brooklyn or the Lower East Side. Yes. Well, I think it was the, the tonic or the elixir of New York City uh, of all these kids of immigrants. And there were there were other ethnicities that were involved. But one of the things that I've discovered is that... Um, the music publishing business was something that Jews could get into that uh, was not prejudiced, so they could mm-hmm. get into that business. And then these publishers would go to the synagogues and find uh, kids who sang in the, in the synagogue choirs to become song pluggers, to go to the other vaudeville houses and sing songs for them. So they, these young boys who were recruited to do the song plugging, a lot of them became songwriters. 
And so it was just part of that community that evolved in that way. It's fascinating because a lot of these people, as you point out in, in, in your book and in various interviews I've seen you give, these were not educated men. Uh, Gershwin was described as a, as a street urchin. Yes, yes. George, I mean, not Ira. Yes, that, that would be true. He was, he was a kid who was bound to come to no good. I mean, nobody mm-hmm. had any. And it didn't even show an interest in music, by the way. No, he didn't until right. uh, one day uh, the, uh, the Gershwin family uh, got a piano because Ira, who was the oldest of four kids, was supposed to take lessons, as the oldest boy is or was in those days. And when the piano arrived, George sat down and started playing, and Ira was there, and he couldn't believe it. That's, George said, I didn't know you could play the piano. And George had been picking it up, out a piano at a friend's house. He'd been noodling on it. And, and so it just was there. It was just there, and he, and, and, and he he couldn't get the music out fast enough. As quickly as he could conceive something, it came through. Unbelievable. Uh, it, it was unbelievable because that's what uh, Maury Riskind in his book, uh, Shot an Elephant in My Pajamas, he talks about how it was just uh, divine to see how this music flowed through George. It has to be. Did, did you ever see the um, Amazing Stories episode where Lainey Kazan plays a psychic who turns into George Gershwin and is channeling no, these songs. No, but we'll, we'll watch it now. Well, it's yeah. fantastic because she plays the psychic who's this, she, she turns into George Gershwin and she says, kid, I couldn't write the songs down fast enough because this guy in the plot is supposed to be writing a score for a Broadway show. He's played by Bob Balaban and, he, oh. and he's gone dry. So he goes to a psychic who channels George Gershwin and he steals all of these Gershwin songs that George has channeled. So they had all these sounded like Gershwin songs, like, um, let's see. Balboa thought it was terrific when he discovered the Pacific. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Both Clark and Lewis brought something to us and I discovered you. All these, you know, instead of, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus, they were Paul, uh, Paul Bartel and John Meyer wrote all these sounded like Gershwin songs. That's great. And it was, it was hysterical. Well, we got to watch that episode now. Yeah, it's great. But by, by the way, on the subject of they all laughed, it's one of the, one of the sweet things in the, in the book. And you're again, back to your relationship with Ira. Uh, was it your birthday or you were sick and he called you and, and, or, or he would, he would sing you different passages from they oh, all left. I, I shortly after I started working for Ira, about two months after, uh, I came down with mono, infectious mm-hmm. mono. That's 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 in the days of when. when that, I'm sorry, I mangled the story. No, no, it's all right. No, those were the yeah. days when mono was considered a serious disease. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I was housebound for uh, I guess a couple of weeks, and Ira would call me every day and sing. Uh, a line of they all laughed every day he'd call and he'd sing the next so line great. and the next line and uh, can, i was very touched by that that's so can, great can we hear some of that some of we all, uh yeah. of they all laughed uh yeah oh okay um okay the odds were a hundred to one against me the world thought the heights were too high to climb but people from Missouri never incensed me. Oh, I wasn't a bit concerned. Far from history, I had learned how many, many times the world had turned. They all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. They all laughed when Edison recorded sound. They all laughed at Wilbur and his brother when they said that man could fly. They told Marconi, Wireless was a phony, it's the same old cry. They laughed at me, wanting you, said I was reaching for the moon. But oh, you came through, now they'll have to change their tune. They all said we'd never stay together Darling, let's take a bow Ho, 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 who's got the last laugh? He, 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 let's have the fast laugh Ha, 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 who's got the last laugh now? Wow. (laughs) Wow. So, So that song helped cure you of mono. It did. It did. 
Uh, it's so sweet. I mean, that's why I say, Michael, it, the story, the, the 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 friendship between these two people plays. It plays like a movie. He has that wonderful line that he's he's so impressed with what you know about him, and and this is a this is a line for the ages. He says, uh, "You have an advantage over me." Oh yeah. You want to you, you finish the line? Well, we had an argument about the chronology of when something happened in his life, and yeah, and um, he was adamant about it, and I finally found proof uh, with a, a book or something. And I showed, I said, see, the, uh, and he said, well, you were right. He said, but you have an advantage over me. And I said, what is that? He said, I've only lived my life. You've thoroughly researched it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's a, that's great. And what's the Mel Torme story too, if, if I may uh, ask you to tell that, because that's, <laughs> that's an example of the man's kindness. Yes, it is. Mel Torme was one of the great singers and I, I adore his work. He was a prickly human being. And it, yeah, it, we, we have heard that before. Yeah, on this show. yeah. It, it's no secret that Judy Garland called him Mel Torment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Mel was appearing at the Hollywood Bowl and Mel sometimes would get very, very hip. You know, uh, like I remember once on The Tonight Show, he did a, 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 a fast, jazzy version of Send in the Clowns. You know, Isn't it rich? Mm, mm, aren't we a pair? Mm. Mm. Me here at last on the ground, you in midair, you know, send in the clown. Oh, Kassanheim must have loved it. I can only imagine, you know, and he recorded he it with Buddy it. Rich. But it's just like, really? And so he was doing this, uh, he was doing Gershwin songs and he was doing a Porgy and Bess medley. It ended with, Bess, you is my woman now. You is, you is, you is, and you must laugh and sing and dance for two instead of one. You know, all that. And... Um, uh, he, I think he must have recorded it, and I saw him afterwards, and he said, "Oh man, I hope Michael, I hope, man, I hope Ira loves the way I sing his songs. I hope he likes the way I do them." And I was very gentle, and I said, "Well, he he loves your voice." I said, "Sometimes he just wishes you wouldn't take some of the liberties." And he said, "Oh no," he said, "I would be crushed. I would be crushed, man, if I if I if I didn't think Ira didn't like the way I sang his song. That would be oh my god, I'd be crushed." So. I was telling Ira about it, and, and Ira said, just tell him I love him. Tell him I adore him. I said, but you don't like the way he takes his liberties. He says, no, I don't, but so what? Just write him a letter and tell him I love him. So I did. That's beautiful. That, 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 that really speaks to the man's generosity yes. of, of, of spirit, his humanity, which, of course, never knowing Ira Gershwin as you did, and you do, you do point out in the book that he has to be a sentimentalist to write the things he writes, even though you said he could not express some of those things in life. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely what he put not. down on the page. And that's, that's just fascinating. Yes. Well, I guess that was his means of expression, even though he always claimed that he never put any of himself in a song, except someone to watch over me. He admitted to me that the line, uh, he may not be the man some girls think of as handsome. He wrote about himself. Because he wrote that song when he married Leonor Gershwin and he felt he was so lucky to win this beautiful woman because he, compared to his brother George, was chubby and wore glasses and didn't think he was attractive to the opposite sex. Uh, but um, he, he did channel his, his self into the music and lyrics, even though he didn't see it that way. It's sad in a way that that, that came out of him on the page. I mean, you look at a line like from uh, from Love is Here to Stay. I mean, in, in time, the Rockies may crumble, Gibraltar may tumble, they're only made of clay. I mean, th that's poetry. Well, of course. To, po to, to, to be obvious. Yes. Well, that, that, of course, is the last song. Well, not of course. Yeah. Some people may not know. But it's the last song that the Gershwin brothers wrote together. Uh, George died uh, before they finished the song. And it was Oscar Levant who notated the rest of it. The composer Vernon Duke claimed that he wrote the verse to the song, but actually Ira wrote the words and the music to the verse of the song because uh, George had, had died. And I said, but Ira, Vernon Duke said he wrote it. And Ira said, you can tell that I wrote it. The music is so undistinguished. And wow. uh, anyway, Ira did write it. And, and so the, the words to the verse to me are the most poignant because they were his his love letter, his message to his lost brother. So, I mean, as you say, George's talent was divine, but is it possible in some way that Ira Gershwin could actually be underrated? I think all lyricists are underrated, except perhaps Johnny Mercer, you know, or, or I don't know, 
Lorenz Hart, uh, Cole Porter, oh. uh, uh, where he wrote both. Ha- Hammerstein people talk about. And- yes. It, it's yeah. funny uh, hearing that lyric, uh, may, uh, man, some girls think of as handsome. It's like before I thought, you know, it's a witty, catchy lyric. And now all of a sudden it takes on such a new meaning, the way you explained it. It's poignant. It's poignant, you know. Although he may not be the man some girls think of as handsome. It's all how you interpret it. That's the thing that I've learned. You know, you, and that's why the songs survive, because they're, they have great bones you can interpret them in. Of course. In millions of different ha- ways. Which we'll talk about when we when we talk about the new country album, but uh, uh, that's a perfect segue. But I did want to ask, uh, tell us a little bit about their process. And there's this wonderful line, I think it's your line, that, that uh, it was an extraordinary coincidence uh, that, uh, that the same family produced two geniuses who were able to work so well together. Yes, that, and, that's... and how did they? How exactly did they collaborate? I mean, you, you, you said in an interview that I saw with uh, Terry Gross, where you were talking about sometimes uh, uh, Ira had to make sense yes. of the melody of what he was given to work with. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, uh, usually Ira preferred a tune first because uh, then he didn't have to worry about the composer messing up the the, uh, the scan of a lyric. And Frank Lesser wrote a very uh, funny song about uh, uh, singing on the wrong syllable. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can play it. On the island from which we come, the point of interest besides the coconut and the sarong is that we put the accent upon the wrong syllable and we sing a tropical song. Put the accent on the wrong <laughs> syllable. You know, and that's what I'm, I were I'm... worried about, you know, that the accent would be on the wrong syllable. But uh, a great example of um, Iris' process is when George played him the tune of, of, of this. Well, Ira had to figure out what kind of lyric would, would fit with that. So he started experimenting with, with dummy lyrics. Roly-poly, eating solely, ravioli, better watch your diet or bust. Now, the purpose of that <laughs> lyric was <laughs> to get right. an idea of how any words would sound with a tune. Right? right, right, and he felt that using a, a lyric that rhymed, "roly poly eating solely," he said that sounds too sing-songy, it rhymes. So then he started experimenting with blank verse, which is anathema to a songwriter, not rhyming. But he went, "Just go forward, don't look backward, da, 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 and you'll soon be ahead of the game." And he thought that's weird, but this 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 tune sounds like the lyric shouldn't rhyme, and so he came up with eventually. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. Doesn't rhyme, except for the bridge. Old man trouble, I don't mind him, you won't find him round my door. And then Ethel Merman sang it, you know, hanging around my front of back door, ah, ah. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> but um, I got rhythm. It was Irving Berlin who said, you'd better never write a bad song for Ethel Merman, because if you do, you'll hear it. Was it was it Ira who didn't like Ethel Merman? Didn't like Ethel Merman. He didn't like Ethel. Uh, okay, Merman. I won't ask you why. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, and when she sang "I Got Rhythm" in the second chorus, she sang. Ah, 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 ah. So I took her recording and I I spliced it together so she holds the note for about sixty seconds. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> And played it for him. I said, I have a new and, recording of Ethel Merman. And he, 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 and, he fell down. And you mentioned something yeah, just now that, that I was going to get to. And it's funny that you... Sh- I, I remember hearing the writer of um, Tifa 2 on, like, Murphy. Irving Caesar, who wrote the lyric. Irving wrote the song in two minutes. As quickly as any New humans could play the tune on the piano, I wrote the lyric. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dummy lyric. It's just a dummy lyric. It meant absolutely nothing. And Vincent said, it's good. Keep it. I said, no, it stinks, Vincent. It stinks, Vincent. He said, no, Irving, keep it. Keep it. It's wonderful. All right. So I took the lyric and I sat down and I wrote the print. It's a dummy. I said, Vincent, I'll fix it later. Picture you upon my knee. A T for two and two. For T, me for you. You for me. It's, it stinks. No, it's great, Irving. It's great. It's Vincent, I'll fix it later. And it became the lyric. We will raise the family. A boy for you, a girl for me. Wrote the song in two minutes. Right. And, and, uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, when, when he was on the show, I remember that was the first time I heard that term, dummy lyrics. Yes. And and uh, I, I, 
according to the story, a T for two were the dummy lyrics. For exactly. That yes. Wow. He, he was just picture you upon my knee. T for two, two for T, me for you and you for me alone. It was just dummy. And Vincent said, it's good. It's good. It's good. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll write it later. And that that lyric stayed. The whole lyric. Yeah, someone said to him, just no, that's it. That's it. Stick with that. And they did. Er, er, Irving Caesar sounds like a wonderful character, too. So, so many of these guys. Uh, so a question from uh, your friends and ours, John Tita and Seth Saltzman at ASCAP, our friends at ASCAP, who, by the way, say uh, they're friends with Julia Riva, uh, uh, Harry Warren's granddaughter, who you who they say you must be friends with as well. Yes, I've, I, I've known Julia Ever since I knew Harry back in the day. Oh, we'll talk about Harry in a minute. Yeah, they yeah. had a question for you, though, Michael. Did Ira talk about projects uh, that he and George had planned uh, for the late 30s, uh, projects that were developed but never saw the light of day uh, once tragedy struck? Was there anything, was there anything on the boards? Yes. Uh, uh, George wanted to write a second opera after Porgy and Bess. He was discussing... Uh, a, a novel called The Lights of Lamy with Lynn Riggs, who also wrote Green Grow the Lilacs that became Oklahoma. That was uh, in the works. He also was planning on writing a symphony. He had conceived in entirety a string quartet, which he played on the piano for Harold Arlen. And after uh, George died, uh, Harold called Ira and said, did he write down the string quartet? And he hadn't. And it was George's intention to basically 50-50, continue to work in musical theater and film, writing scores, and then uh, making enough money to work on his classical or more serious concert music. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two would have gone side by side. Ira did not speak of specific projects that they were working on, but certainly their, their uh, film contracts would have been even further extended because they came to Hollywood to write one movie and ended up writing four scores in uh, the nine months he was there before he passed away, George Eddis. It's one of the great tragedies uh, in, in the history of the culture to, to lose that man yes. uh, in, in, in his late 30s. I agree. Uh, uh, given what what uh, what he produced and and uh, and what may have come, let's talk a, a little bit about you and something you and Gilbert had in common. You both uh, were guest programmers on TCM uh. with our, with our late uh, beloved friend Robert Osborne. He was terrific. We Wonderful had him here, guy. and we adored the guy. Yeah. What did, what did you pick? I have no idea. <laughs> I saw you introduce. <laughs> I don't even remember. I saw you introducing all about Eve, and I thought that's interesting. It's not not, not a musical. No, no. It's just I think one of the most perfectly crafted films. It's just it is a beautiful it's, film. It, it, and I I think Road to Morocco was one of your one of your picks. Uh, one, I, one of your I believe you. Well, I believe yeah. you. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. of course, I'm a, I'm a huge Crosby fan and loved Bob Hope. And, did and you work with Bob Hope? You were in a Bob Hope special in the early 90s? Yes, he did a special for my hometown in Columbus, Ohio, and, and I was a guest there, and boy, were my parents cavelling, you know? I wow. bet. And he was, he, was, he was a sweet guy. He was, he was wonderful. I appeared with him, I think it was his last appearance in public. It was at the McCallum Theater in Palm Springs. It was a benefit for the theater or some kind of special evening. And I was there with Rosemary Clooney and Bob and his wife, Dolores. And um, he was not very responsive at that point. And I was very concerned that they would allow him to go out on stage. And then they s announced his name and he went from being sort of bent over. He became fully upright and he walked out uh, right to center stage with the spotlight there and says, I want to tell you, it's great to be here tonight and started doing routines. It's, it's like, it's like he, he completely woke up. It's like something plugged wow. in and he was even ad-libbing and talking and he was fantastic. And then he walked off stage and it's like he went back to sleep again. It, I've never seen anything like it. Gilbert does every show that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although, <laughs> minus the wake up part. <laughs> That's funny. We will return to Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. But first, a word from our sponsor. Now, We're talking now you ahead, Gil. also, last time we had Uncle Junior from The Sopranos. I sent the clip. I don't know if Susan shared it with you. I, I sent uh, Dominic Chianese, um 
playing Brother Can You Spare a Dime on this show. No, no, no. On oh, acoustic guitar. Can, can we hear some of that, please? Moria Parberg. Yeah, well... Uh, I'll, I'll send you the clip. It's quite quite, uh, quite uh, beautiful. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. And understated. Uh, can, can we hear a little of that from you? I'm asking... I'm putting you on the spot. You're asking me? Second. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, um... All right, well, I'm back to my piano bar days. No, can you have a few bars? He's taking requests. <laughs> sure. Well, from from the illustrious talents as, as yourself, of course. Uh, I'll see. Uh, <laughs> Once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower to the sun, brick and rivet and line. Once I built a tower. Now it's done, buddy. Can you spare a dime? I didn't Beautiful. want to go into the whole khaki boots Beautiful. part. You know? Yeah. Oh, Let's great. give proper credit to Jay Gorney and uh, and and Yip Harbor. And they swapped wives, you know. I didn't know that. Yeah, they both swapped wives. <laughs> you got all the information, Michael. Wow. Let, let's talk about the new album, because we're talking about Gershwin music and, and how adaptable it is and how durable it is. And, and uh, you've got a new project, which is Gershwin Country. Yes. Which is a, 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 a bold, innovative idea. It's something that happened as a result of my friendship with Maya Angelou, uh, with, who, to, with whom I was close for years. And... and uh, wrote a, a song about uh, for celebrating Lincoln's uh, 200th birthday. And I was staying with Maya uh, in Winston-Salem and she started playing her favorite music. And, and a lot of it was country music. It started really educating me uh, about country music in, in the sense that the last great storytellers of lyrics, interpreters of lyrics is I, I feel, and she felt in the country genre. And uh, we went so far as to discuss Maya executive producing a country album for me because uh, she was that deep into it. And she said, yes, wow. but then she, she passed away. And um, it wasn't until a few years ago, I was lying in bed and I had this morning errant thought that was sort of drifting around about taking the Gershwin songs and doing them with a Nashville band. And then I started thinking about voices and singers and thought, well, this could be duets. And um, that's exactly what, it became, it, it, it's, I must say it's quite extraordinary because if you don't know these songs and you hear this recording uh, with this group of Nashville musicians and the other voices, such as Dolly Parton and, and Roseanne Cash. I heard the uh, Alison Krauss one is wonderful. Alison Krauss. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's, it, the songs are organic. They sound like they were written in that style. And, and um, it's, it's one of the most joyous experiences I've ever had working on an album because we were in the studio working with the band, improvising, let's change key here, let's try this, let's try that. And they were just so facile. And so it was different from anything else I had ever done because it was truly on the spot and spontaneous. Wow. And um, a great experience, great experience. And the, and the album, as, as the kids say, drops March 11th? Yes, yes, March 11th. It 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 is it is a tribute in a way to that that Gershwin music that that you can you can interpret it so many different ways. Oh yeah, yeah, and I may Isn't it? I, I may be wrong, but I think uh, even though Dolly certainly knew Gershwin, she didn't seem to be that familiar with "Love Is Here to Stay," which we sing together. And I know some of the other artists were not familiar with these songs, and that was part of the fun of it because they just interpreted on face value. Uh, uh, doing They Can't Take That Away From Me with Amy Grant. I, yeah. I don't, I don't think yeah. she knew that song. Or The Time Jumpers and Vince Gill doing Fascinating Rhythm. Uh, uh, they they, they uh, just sort of peripherally knew the song. And we were, it, we were trying to figure out how to make it sound authentically country. And we just started fooling around and, and there it was. 
or with Lyle Lovett doing Clap Your Hands. That was so much fun. I, I flew to Houston to do that one. I bet. Is, is it an extra kick to turn the seasoned musicians onto songs that they don't know? It must be. It's joyous. That's, that, that's the educator in you and the, and the musicologist in you. Yeah, it was fun. And, and, I, and I would play them vintage recordings in the studio, like listen to this or listen to this riff or listen to how they did this and did that. And so it was great. And I learned so much from them, uh, Lord knows, about uh, improvising and, and um, uh, technical stuff, too, because they're mm-hmm. all great artists. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the other and, project... Uh, go ahead, Gil. No, I, I I, know I'm making you work on this <laughs> one. <laughs> so once again, I want to hear I Love a Piano. Oh, oh. That's, his, that's, that's one of his signature songs. Uh, we're, back to, we're back to Irving Berlin. Yes, we are. Uh, 1915, I think. Yeah. Got to get that tuned. <laughs> I love a piano. I love a piano. I love to hear somebody play on a piano. A grand piano. It simply carries me away. I know a fine way to treat Steinway. I love to run my fingers over the keys, the ivories, and with the pedal. I love to meddle when. Liberace comes my way. <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> when I'm invited. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, to hear that long haired genius play. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> well, you can keep your fiddle and your bow. Give me a P I A N O. Oh, 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 I love to stop right. Beside an upright or a high tone, baby grand. Oh yeah! Fantastic. I didn't give it uh, the full throttle treatment because uh, I didn't want to bust people's eardrums. So. This is like being at 54 Below. Okay? This is a yeah. Michael Feinstein show. Thank I you. feel a- like I set him up, you knock him down. <laughs> you bet. What, a, what a treat. <laughs> what, okay, now I'm going to make you work, Gilbert. Oh, geez. Uh, uh, one of, uh, if I have this right, Michael, one of Ira's uh, uh, last works, last great works, was uh, The Man That Got Away. Yes. Oh. In, in, in A Star Is Born. Gilbert's going to favor you now with a little of his James Mason from A Star is Born. <laughs> Congratulations, dear. I seemed to remain it just in time, didn't I? I? I had a whole speech prepared in my head, but it seems to have gone out of it. Uh, well, I, I, I don't need to be so formal. I know most of you gentlemen. Well, the The point is I need a job. Yes, that's it. That's my whole speech. I I need a job. I I, I not confined to drama. I could do comedy as well. That's fantastic. (laughs) Oh my god, you have it you have it spot on. I met him once. Did you ever meet him? No, I wish I could. Oh, do tell. Oh, I have a photo with him. Uh it was at the restoration of A Star is Born when they restored all the lost footage of the thing and and I had helped peripherally supply uh, something that Ira Gershwin had. Ira was still alive at the time and James and Althea Mason were there and he was the most delightful man and and, uh, 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 and there was that voice coming out of him, you know. That's was, nice to hear. Oh, it was something. He was charming and um, it was a great thrill. Oh, and I this just is- remembered, this is one of those things that would kill me if I, uh, I didn't, and just for my own good, uh, I just remember that lyric that I fucked up Oh. On the uh, on the uh, Groucho thing. Stay down where you was, belong. Uh, 
You'll find more hell up there than you will down here below. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, what that was, was the just other? That would bother me the whole time. What was I the other so. one he would sing on the Dinah Shore show? Was it Peasy Weezy? Oh, I don't know the words to that, but yeah, I know that was the another, song. That was, yes. and, and, and Father's <laughs> Father's Day oh. too. Today, dear father. Today, dear father, is Father's Day, and we're giving you a tie. It isn't much we know. It's just our way of showing you we think you're a regular guy. You say we really didn't have to bother, but dear father, it was really no fuss, no fuss. For according to our mother, you're our father, and that's good enough for us. <laughs> yeah. I used to sing that to my dad every Father's Day. Oh. So. And the ties that we got. Didn't cost an awful lot, <laughs> and we'll get you the same tie next year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Michael, will you will you take Gilbert on tour? Absolutely. <laughs> this could be a thing. This could I'll be, be Groucho, and you'll be Chico. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I'll I'll be Alan Jones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, alone, alone on a night that was meant for love. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had your friend Jack Jones here a couple of weeks ago. Oh, Jack is but, great. By the way, let's let's do a segue here too because we're talking about a star is born just a minute ago, and another project of yours is well, it's the Judy Garland 100th year, the centenary of of Judy Garland. You did some shows at your own club in December, and uh, there's a tour coming to yes. celebrate Ju Judy's life and career. Ye yes, yes, multimedia. Uh, exactly. It the, the club was was a tryout. I did act one one week and act two the next week. And since that time, I I, I did the show with a big band in Naples, Florida, and it was uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I was more scared doing a Judy Garland tribute than a Frank Sinatra tribute because I knew, really why? Well, because with Sinatra, I knew I could I could weave the story with different anecdotes and having met him and bring in some unusual songs that right. illustrated it. But Judy is so iconic and in a different way of course sinatra is equally iconic but for me to try to figure out how i had anything to say about judy garland where's the connection other than my adoration and love even though i know her family very well and have met many people who knew her and worked with her in stories so it was trying to find my personal voice that would relate to each individual and i think that i found that through uh, the stories that I've chosen to tell and getting home movies from the family and photographs and such. And uh, it, 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 it works gangbusters. And I do a lot of different routines of songs, so I'm not copying her, even though, though mm -hmm. I do a couple of her routines because people would like to hear them. And I make it very clear that I'm not trying to imitate or copy her in any way because that's just silly. And an odd thing happened a few years ago where... And this is kind of like a Michael Feinstein experience that I was visiting the house that uh, Judy Garland had built for her mother in 1939. Uh, and I was looking through the house, going through the house, and something drew me to a part of the house. There was a wall there, and, I, and it turned out that it was a fake wall. And behind the wall were a series, a whole a stack of, of old recording discs. And I knew that she had had a home recording machine. And I took the recordings home, and they were recordings home recordings of Judy Garland singing. Uh, and one of the recordings was Judy singing, I'll be seeing you a cappella, without accompaniment. And she had never, ever performed or sung that song anywhere, ever. It's not documented. She ever sang it. There it was. So in the show, Whoa. I accompany her singing this, this song. Oh, that's lovely. So it's very, it's a very special moment. What a, what a great thing to put in the show. You know, you and because you, it's important to you. You want you want younger generations to know the the you know not just the tawdry stuff, not just the the way that people talk about Judy Garland and remember Judy Garland and the and the and the the, the, the tragic parts. You you you. It's important to you to reeducate. Well, yes, because it's so easy to just look at the tragedy, but but it is because of the enormity of her talent that we remember her and of course uh, but you know we live in a time where uh, people focus on the tragedy it's it's it, when i hope i'm not speaking out of school but when garland's daughter lorna loved went to see 
the, uh, the movie with Renee Zellweger, I said, well, what did you think? She said, Michael, it was about as realistic as cats. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, because... About, about as realistic as Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, yeah, there's another one. <laughs> right, yeah, where, right. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I was... When my friend Jay Livingston died, uh, he was interred at Westwood Mortuary near Marilyn Monroe. And uh, there were two young girls who were putting flowers on Marilyn Monroe's uh, stone. Uh, and I said, you're, you're fans of Marilyn? She said, oh, we love her. And I said, well, what... Marilyn Monroe movies do you like? And, she, and one of the girls said, oh, we've never seen any of her movies. And it's like, okay, then it's just oh. the legend or the persona. Yeah, the, le the legend. Or the, the the sadness of the death or whatever. It's all of that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I can't believe I missed the show here in, in, uh, in New York in December. I hope you bring it back to New York. As, I'm, as I'm part, intending as, to. As part of the tour, because we, we will... Uh, we will make a pilgrimage. Uh, are you going to be Gilbert's in Boca, by the way? Don't you? You have. Uh, I noticed on your website, you're going to be down in Florida. Yes, I've got a date, another date at the Kravis Center in, in Palm Beach, and uh, then I'll be in uh, Clearwater again. And uh, they day love trip. me in Florida. What can I tell you, <laughs> Gilbert? Gilbert and Dara day trip. Uh, it's, oh, we well, are very uh, welcome. Believe me. Speaking, speaking of Judy, and I'm going to make another segue here, and I'm going to show this to you, M Michael, which may not mean as much to you as it means to me, because uh, Hugh Martin was a friend of yours, and you must have many artifacts. Ah, John I wrote, Fricky. I wrote you a letter. Hugh, I wrote him a letter telling him how much I loved Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, and he sent me back this signed sheet music. Can you see this? I'm sorry the show is not video. Can you see that he wrote the little notes along the top? That's fantastic. One of, one of my prized possessions. Uh, he's, and, and, he's one of the few. You, you knew the man. Uh, well, he's one of the few writers of a, a standard Christmas song who wasn't Jewish. That's right. Okay, well, <laughs> well, Gilbert gets a kick out of that. Yeah, it seems like like 99% of the greatest Christmas songs were written by Jews. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, you can go down the line. The Christmas Song by Mel Torme. He and Bob Wells were Jewish. Let it right. snow, uh, Jewish. Uh, all, all those Johnny Mark songs from the Johnny from Marks. The, from, uh, yeah. uh, I'll be home for Christmas. Uh, Kim Gannon was Jewish. I mean, you could. Uh, we need a little Christmas. Jerry Herman was Jewish. White Christmas. Uh, White Christmas, of course, Irving Berlin. I mean, how hard would it have been to write? I'm dreaming of a white Hanukkah. You know, I mean, <laughs> how hard would that have been? You know, but he didn't do it. <laughs> With every Christmas card, I cried. <laughs> and, you know, and he is a Yiddish card. I don't know. So. I think one of my favorite parts of your vast and impressive output is is the albums that you got to do with your heroes, with Jerry Herman and 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 Burton Lane. I mean, can you sh and, and Hugh Martin and Ray Livingston and Gilbert and I were getting a kick out of uh, uh, Jay Livingston. Excuse me, uh, Gilbert and I were getting a kick out of the fact that on the on the Jay Livingston uh, album, you even included the Mister Ed theme. Yes, to, well, how be, could to be you a not? completist. Yes, yeah. horses and horses. And Jay Livingston sang the original uh, uh, theme for the TV series. That's Jay Livingston's voice because the producers were too cheap to hire a singer. I didn't know that. So that's fun. Yeah. What 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 is a, a what is a, a horse a, is a horse, of course, of course, <laughs> and no one can talk to a horse, of course, unless of course the famous horse is a famous Mister Ed. Go right to the source and ask the horse. And he'll give you the answer that you endorse. Yeah. He's always there in a steady course, the famous Mr. Ed. You got to get these records. I am Mr. Ed. <laughs> is, is, is there a, is there a, and it must have been wonderful for you, uh, the, the ultimate uh, uh, fan of these people and admirer of these people, to, 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 to sing their songs you know, being accompanied by by Hugh Martin on the piano or Burton Lane, what a what a what a dr what a dream come true! It was a dream come true. Uh, actually, Hugh Martin and Burton Lane were the two best pianists of all the uh, songwriters because they sometimes were great songwriters but didn't play piano well. Irving Berlin was a terrible piano player. So was Jerome Kern. So was Harry Warren. Harry Warren used to joke about it. He'd say Kern plays with one finger, Berlin with two, and me with three. You know, I mean, it was they were all rudimentary but it was in the head and they were able to re realize it but uh burton lane played orchestrally and hugh martin was incredible
incredible accompanist. And he, he was a great vocal arranger. He, he was staggering. Sondheim was a huge fan of you, Martin. Everybody was. Everybody was. What, I mean, a, what a nice man. He, and, and, you know, I didn't meet him, but we, we did correspond. And it was, uh, it's, it's still a thrill to me because I, I, I love that song to death. It's a great song. And, and uh, it's, it's a thing that Hugh actually wrote music and lyrics uh, without Ralph Blaine. Ralph oh, he credited, credited it. Ralph Blaine yeah. because, of, because of a partnership? Uh, yes, yes, because they had a, a, an agreement, but Hugh wrote it entirely on his own. And, of course, he changed the lyric when Sinatra recorded it because Sinatra said it was too sad. So he changed it from the original was, But till then we'll have to muddle through somehow to hang a shining star upon the highest bow. So he changed the lyrics to make it less sad. But there didn't, is... didn't Judy react that way when he submitted the original lyric yeah, about yeah, living yeah. in the past? Well, the original lyric, uh, which was not used, was Have yourself a merry little Christmas. This may be your last. Next year we will all be living in the past. And she said, that's too damn depressing. I can't sing that, especially to a child. And then and uh, Hugh refused to change the lyric. And then Tom Drake, who played the boy next door in Meet Me in St. Louis, went to him and said, you know, you're being an ass. And Hugh said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, just change that lyric. You'd have Judy Garland singing a Christmas song, for God's sake. Yeah. And Hugh thought yeah. the better of it. And, and as happens, the lyrics that he rewrote were better. And that's what went into the film. Yeah. That, the original lyrics make me want to jump in front of a train. Yeah, but they're beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are beautiful. Well crafted, but too on the nose, perhaps. Yeah. And, and it, uh, you know what? Another thing, when you were talking about how uh, a lot of these composers can't play and stuff like that, I always noticed it about like Bert, uh, Bert Lancaster, Bert Bacharach singing. Right. It's like, it's like totally off key. He's one of the greatest composers, but his singing is completely off key. Well, it's stylized. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> what, we, what, should, what should we say about your singing, Gilbert? Is it stylized? <laughs> well, he, he learned singing from me. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, my, my singing teacher was Bert Lahr. But would give me the full, ooh, 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 ooh. you know, you know, I mean, that was, he was the best, you know, you know, if only he had been around to do like the Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, it would have been perfect. You know? oh, Don't cry you... for me, Argentina. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> you know, all that. <laughs> well, I, 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 she was the greatest star of, ooh, 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 ooh. you know. <laughs> You missed your calling as a mimic, <laughs> uh, Michael. And I've heard you talk about how you learned to be a performer and you learned patter in those piano bars and you learned you learned it well, my friend. Thank you. You play for Billy Wilder at one point. I've, I found all kinds of little oh, gems well, researching you. Yeah, Sammy Kant's house. You know, everybody was there and, and uh, Billy Wilder was always there with his wife, Audrey, who was not very nice to me. And she was a singer, so maybe she oh, didn't I'm like my sorry. music. Oh, that's right. But, the, the, but they were all... I mean, Billy Wilder, oh my God, you know, I mean, I, and, the, and the last, the last uh, uh, lyrics that Ira wrote was for the film Kiss Me Stupid, which Billy uh, uh, created. Uh, and uh, uh, I would play songs from Kiss Me Stupid just to irritate him and say, no, Mr. Feinstein, please, Mr. Feinstein, stop, please, no, don't play those, no, stop, I beg you, I beg you. you know, that's what he would do. So. Please, Mr. Feinstein. So you met you met William Wyler and Billy Wilder. No, I met Mrs. Wyler. Oh, not, Mrs. Wyler. Okay, yes. I, okay. Yeah, but, it, but you but you also did meet, and this is the and, and this is just wonderful information. You met Dolores Del Rio. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I did because <laughs> I was at I was at a party. June Levant took me to a party at the studio of Tony Duquette, the uh, great designer. And Dolores Del Rio was there. And, and, and like I did with Sinatra, I thought, how can I get her attention? So I started to play the song Ramona, in which she starred in 1928. So I was playing. Ramona, I hear the mission bells above. And she was, she had her back to me, was talking to someone. And she whirled around and gave this very low, deep, aristocratic bow. And then went fall up again and turned back. And we had this... This moment, uh, again, you know, it was speaking the language. I, I met Dolores Del Rio, Anne Southern was there, all of these. Oh, Anne these, Southern. Uh, yes, who, who, who replaced, who, who did the road tour of, of the I Sing uh, in 1932. She had this beautiful high soprano voice and was quite a fine singer. 
Do you know the Dolores Del Rio song from the from the yes. short-lived Carl yeah, Reiner I, I musical? Don't, I don't know it by <laughs> heart, but it was Ginny Mancini's favorite song, and I sang it at her at her oh, last birthday celebration. It's a masterwork. I mean, ri- ri- we had Richard Kind sang it on this podcast. Sister and Dolores uh, Del Rio. No, da, da, da. So true. Written by, I believe, the comedy writer Stan Daniels. Yes, he was He was incredible. Yes. Yeah, and, a, and a Frank funny guy. Was, Frank was telling me uh, a Vincent Price story. Oh, that's related to Dolores Del Rio. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I was close to Vincent and... Uh, uh, he, he he was so funny. Uh, he'd say that every time he came off stage, he would say, fold him again. <laughs> uh, but but he uh, sometimes, if somebody asked for an autograph, he would sign Dolores Del Rio. And I said, why did you sign Dolores Del Rio? And he said, because the last time I saw her, she said, don't let them forget me. So I he signed that. Dolores Del Rio. I love that. See, he got to know Vincent Price. You got to know everybody, Michael. Well, Say a couple of words about Rosemary Clooney, who was, uh, I guess, a mentor to you in some ways and a, and a second mom. Rosemary and Clooney. What uh, a talent. She was my favorite female singer. She was a person whose voice always went deeply into my heart for reasons that one can't explain. You know, we all have different visceral reactions to mm-hmm. different types of art. And the way that she vocalized always was... Uh, very personal for me, which is what one hopes as a singer to be able to accomplish. And Rosemary was Ira Gershwin's next door neighbor. And so um, Lee Gershwin would send me over to the Clooney house to sometimes be her uh, amanuensis to tell them that they weren't feeding their cats properly because Rosemary's cats were coming to the Gershwin house to eat. (laughs) <laughs> and I was trying to explain to Mrs. Gershwin that because she was putting out bay shrimp, that every cat in the neighborhood was coming to eat at their house. And it was true. She would buy bay shrimp at Nathan Owls and put out shrimp, which is addicting for cats. Uh, and so, of course, Rosemary's cats were coming next door Hilarious. to eat the shrimp. But anyway, I got to meet Rosemary. And um, we became very, very close friends, and she generously appeared on my first album and my first major TV appearance. I asked her to uh, come with me on, on the Merv Griffin show, and we ended up, through the years, doing about 200 concerts together, including the Hollywood Bowl and other places. And I miss her every day. What a legend. You know, and it goes, goes back to what I was saying before. You know, you, you, have, been, you have benefited from the kindness of... Well, maybe not strangers, but the kindness of stranglers. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That you know, Mrs. Levant did you a solid, and you you say that you owe your your career in many ways to Ira. Uh, yes. li- you know, Liza uh, uh, was good to you. Rosemary Clooney was good to you. It's a it's a it's a it's it's a it's a beautiful thing that it, that these people that you admired so much returned the kindness. It is um, something that I never have taken for granted. And I always will try and give back to, to others in the same way, because without all of them, I would not be here. And Liza Minnelli, who hosted a huge party for me in California uh, in 1985 when I was playing at the Mondrian Hotel, where she invited all these people that, that I never would have gotten to spend time with. But she did that for me and hosted my first night at the Algonquin in New York. And mm-hmm. So, uh, again, uh, it's something that uh, made it possible for me to do what I love. That's great. Tell us, too, quickly, and we know you got uh, other appointments and you gotta, you got to get out of here, but tell us about the foundation and why it's important. And, and I, I imagine the goal, one of the goals is to build a museum for the American yes. Songbook. Yes, indeed. And, and all these wonderful artifacts that other people have collected, but, but some that you have unearthed. Yes, I started collecting things that were important to me when I was quite young, and I didn't know what I was going to do with these things, but especially after I moved to California, I would find things at estate sales and garage sales that were unique. Mm -hmm. Sometimes music manuscripts or uh, rehearsal recordings or private recordings or ephemera or contracts relating to music uh, in the Great American Songbook. And so uh, by default, uh, I amassed this huge collection of, of memorabilia and music and records. And I still have a, a great deal of it, but I started the Great American Songbook Foundation mm-hmm. as a repository to preserve this material because there 
amazingly, is not a museum for the Great American Songbook. We have uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame. We have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have all yes. these other places, uh, the Blues Museum. But we don't have a, a, a place for the Great American Songbook. And so uh, I created the foundation, first of all, for the artifacts and then to educate young people. And uh, we have a lot of amazing programs in an annual high school songbook academy where 40 kids come from all over the United States to have a week-long intensive to learn about the songbook. And we have great singers and celebrity uh, mentors and coaches mm -hmm. and guides because this music, when they discover it, it becomes another language for them and they're passionate about it. And we've planted the, these seeds with now thousands of kids who are going out and spreading this, this music. So that's a part of it. And then we have a program called Perfect Harmony for people with dementia and Alzheimer's that's taken off because that is a very underserved community. And now we're building a museum. And we've been lucky enough to get seed money to do it. And we're in the planning stages because the collection at this point has amazing artifacts relating to uh, every major uh, singer of the 20th century and many of the composers whose families have donated all kinds of things from Richard Whiting's piano. It was played not only by Richard Whiting, who wrote Hooray for Hollywood and Two Marvelous Words, but it was played by Str Stravinsky and Rachmaninoff and mm -hmm. Gershwin memorabilia. And I have Andy Williams' music library of 150 boxes of orchestra. And all that stuff you found in Secaucus. Secaucus. I mean, there's <laughs> all of this stuff. It's, it's, yeah. And so it now is preserved and cataloged and is available. We have Meredith Wilson's archive. Wow. Uh, from The Music Man and beyond. And, and uh, uh, we helped... Uh, supply some of the unpublished songs that were written for Music Man and not used that they were considering for the revival. So those sorts of things are thrilling to be able to be involved with. You're, you're doing the Lord's work. I know you've been told that, but it's really true. You're, you're, doing, you're doing important work. That's and you're, and you're honoring the memory and, and the work of these people. Uh, you're, 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 you're giving it a second life and a third life, and it's, uh, it's uh, very admirable. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> And thank you, Gilbert. I think you're absolutely wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's plug the upcoming hello, Garland. Gilbert. Well, hello, <laughs> Gilbert. <laughs> I'm sorry, Frank. Were you saying something? I was going to plug the Garland show again, <laughs> uh, uh, which is uh, the tour that's coming up. Plug away. <laughs> go to your go to your go to your website. Can people go to your website and find out where you're going to be doing this? That's where Michael, I go when I want to find out where I am. Yeah. MichaelFeinstein.com and also the new uh, Gershwin Country album, which drops uh, in March. So much we could talk. I hope you'll come back and play with us another time. We, oh we, didn't, we didn't get into Harry Warren, uh, who was one of mine, Paisan Gilbert, an Italian yeah. guy. Oh, then uh, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, he was—he was the most wonderful person. Uh, it oh sounds like God. you would have loved him, Gilbert, from what yeah. I've learned about yeah, him. Yeah, you would have. Yes, yes, you would have. He, he yeah, had the greatest Frank, sense of humor. Frank was telling me he's one of those people that just didn't promote himself. Yeah, he hired a publicist, and the first time he read something in a column, he fired him. Unbelievable! But what <laughs> what, a, what a body of work. Until we have Michael next time, I urge our listeners to look up uh, Harry Warren, not his real name, uh, but Salvatore Guaragna. Yeah, Salvatore. <laughs> but but what a body of work, uh, and we could go on and on and on with Michael. Um, but maybe he'll take us out with one more song. Let and me thank a couple. Let me thank you a couple knew people. Paul Stewart. Before we go. Oh, Paul Stewart used to come to the house, the character actor. Yes, he uh, used first to come film role was the butler in Citizen Kane. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Mr. Yes. Kane. Uh, he was a uh, very quiet man. <laughs> this he is sounded, the only. Yeah. He sounded oh like he was doing a Bela Lugosi imitation in Citizen Kane. <laughs> this is the only podcast in America, Michael, I can assure you, that's talking about Paul Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Paul. He was great. Uh, let me let me thank Mario, our mutual friend Mario C Cantone, who who was nice enough to write me and said, uh, Michael Feinstein, we, you got to have Michael Feinstein on the show, and here you are, and what a gift it's been. And thank you for listening to the show. That's that a, is that, my great, great pleasure. It's, oh, it's, it's my a, world, and I love you guys. You're so sweet to say that. And we'll thank Susan Mador. Hey, the 28th is my birthday, so you know what I need you to play right now. Really? Ha ha yes. Oh no, that's 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 a that's a nightmare for a for a piano bar musician. <laughs> Happy 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Gilbert. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you, Liberace. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's Michael, my great pleasure. We... What are you doing after the podcast, Gilbert? <laughs> I never thought Liberace would be coming on to me. Tonight. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Go away, Leah. This is my guest spot. Sorry, Michael. Okay, thank you. Michael, you got to do a one-man show. I mean, not just the music, but but st- stories, anecdotes about these people. I mean, you got stories about Rosemary and and Martha Ray and Elaine Stritch and all kinds of things we didn't get we didn't get into. Yes, it's true. T- today, but uh, uh, good luck with the album. We will promote it. Uh, go to Michael's website, michaelfeinstein.com. Uh, go to Apple Music and find Michael's wonderful output and and wonderful albums that he did with all of these great artists. And uh, uh, we, we can't praise you enough or thank you enough for your contributions. Thank you. It's a, a tremendous pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you for your kindness and your generosity. We had a great time and we laughed. And Gilbert, any excuse for Gilbert to sing as Groucho? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> next album. <laughs> we, we want to thank Brendan Lynch and, and uh, Land Romo who were who were there recording uh, uh, Michael today, and all the people who made this episode possible. One of my instant favorite episodes. How about you, Gil? Oh, terrific! Yeah, yes, thank you for terrific. thank you for serenading us. And Michael, we'll see you out there. Indeed, God bless and be well. Thank, thank you, you, pal. Uh, we've been talking to the multi-talented Michael Feinstein. The demon discographer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it, it, it only wow. took me 75 times, but I got it right. That's all that matters. <laughs> Michael, when you, when you meet Gilbert in public, will you refer to him as Gilbert Gottfried or, God, <laughs> funny. or Godfrey just, oh, to, have, just to make me happy? I have a story for next time about, Thank you. about somebody's memorial where they got the name of the decedent wrong. Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, it's, it's true, oh. and I'll tell you. It's, uh, Please come some, back and play uh, with us again. My that great was, pleasure. This was a lot of fun. A thrill for us. For me too, very much thank, so. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care.